Today, you and I are gonna talk about GPUs, how they work, what you should look for in a GPU if you're doing machine learning, inference versus training, and how you can improve your training speed by up to 16 times by just looking for a couple little things when shopping for a GPU. If you do machine learning and deep learning, you probably already know that GPUs do a lot better than CPUs. And to have very fast compute when doing machine learning and deep learning, you need a GPU in your system. But you might not know why, and if you're shopping for a GPU, you might not know exactly what to look for. I didn't, and that's why I went out and I did this research. So I have a couple of links in the description that I've compiled from all the different sources that I looked up to figure out what exactly you need in a graphics card for machine learning and deep learning. Then I made this video, which basically summarizes the top layer of all the research and should help inform you on what you should look for if you're shopping for a GPU for machine learning. So a big thanks to the links in the description because a lot of the examples and numbers that you're gonna be hearing today came directly from them. So if you wanna go check it out and see like more in depth of what I was talking about, you should definitely go check that out. Off to the whiteboard. To start off with our understanding, we're gonna look at the difference between a CPU and a GPU. A CPU is latency optimized, and a GPU is bandwidth optimized. You can think of a CPU like a sports car, like a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. They go very, very quickly from point A to point B, but they can't carry a lot of cargo, and cargo in this case is our memory. GPUs, on the other hand, are sort of like transport trucks. They're much, much larger, but also much slower. They can carry a lot more boxes of memory, but it takes them a lot longer to get from point A to point B. Let's say that you have 30 packages that you wanna move between point A and point B. Your Ferrari can hold one package with each trip. That means it has to make 60 trips between point A and point B to be able to move all the packages to the other side. That's a lot. Now, let's look at a GPU. A GPU can carry 15 packages in the large transport truck, which means that it only has to make four trips to carry all the packages between point A and point B. Knowing that each package in this case represents memory, we can understand why a GPU is better at tasks that require a lot more memory to be used at once, sort of like machine learning. Of course, there's more to the story. Latency will still hurt performance. If your transport truck is 30 times slower than the Ferrari, then it's gonna take equal time for both the CPU and the GPU to deliver all the packages from point A to point B. This just goes to show you, even though you can have a large transport truck, if it moves slower than a turtle, it's not gonna help anything. So now you might be thinking, there is a little bit of downtime, right? Because you have the transport truck traveling from point A to point B with 15 packages, and then coming back from point B to point A empty. That empty-handed trip is wasted time. And when you're working on a really large machine learning model, you don't wanna waste any time. That is where parallelism comes into play. Now imagine you have a fleet of trucks traveling from point A to point B, carrying packages one after another. Instead of having to wait for them to go from B to A to pick up more packages and go back, they're just going in a stream straight from point A to point B. The initial truck might take longer, but once you have a stream of trucks coming, you will not notice the time it takes for these trucks to travel back and forth. You might also note here, this is exactly why CPU threading is not really gonna be very helpful in this case. You have a fleet of Ferraris traveling from point A to point B. It's incredibly wasteful and doesn't make a lot of sense because the latency is already being hidden with the transport trucks and they're delivering a lot more memory at one time. The next thing we have to look at is cache and registers. Cache and registers are like little memory chips that hold all of the data that you've already fetched with that large transport truck and then give access to the processing units to be able to run whatever convolutions or matrix multiplication on it that they have to do. When doing computations at this scale and this speed, even the distance between the cache and registers and the processing unit adds latency to each operation you do. That means the shorter the distance between the cache and registers to the processing unit, the better. Something else that comes up when you're doing computations at this scale is the size of cache and registers matters a lot. The larger they are, the longer it takes to find what you're looking for inside of that memory module. Let's use an analogy. If you wanna buy an orange, you know that if you go to your local small market that's run by a family, it's gonna be relatively easy to find an orange. The store's not that big, you'll be able to walk in, probably see it as soon as you walk in, grab it, pay, and leave. Now let's compare that experience to if you just wanna buy an orange, but you're walking into a Costco. There's a lot more in the way and you have to spend more time finding what you're looking for before you're able to finally check out and leave. This is exactly the same thing that happens with cache and registers that are super, super large. GPUs take the cake over CPUs for those reasons exactly. 
The distance between cache and registers with the processing units on a GPU is much, much smaller than on a CPU. And also, the cache and register size on a GPU is much smaller than a CPU, which means that it's able to walk in, get exactly what it needs, and come out a lot quicker. This means in total that on a GPU, you have much smaller memory modules that work much faster and are dedicated to specific processing units on the GPU. Okay, now this is sort of like comparing apples and oranges. The cache and registers on a CPU and a GPU are not identical. There's differences on how the speed of cache and registers on a CPU versus a GPU work. However, the sizes are effectively the same, so you can compare it at least at this surface level. You might be slightly confused now. You might be saying, how are smaller cache and registers better for the processing units on a GPU versus a CPU when you're going to be storing large files for the machine learning, deep learning applications, and you just spent the last couple of minutes talking about how large transport trucks that can carry more memory is better for a GPU than a CPU. I get your confusion, but the benefit is how fast the processing units are able to access the memory within the cache and registers. They can access it at 80 terabytes per second. What that extra speed means is that the processing units on a GPU are able to share a lot of that memory so they're not recalculating the same matrix tiles or doing convolutions over and over again or having to access the larger, slower memory on a graphics card. They're able to have more of it right at hand, right there, really quick. After mentioning those 80 terabyte per second speeds, it's still very important to remember that even if 95% of the work is done with those 80 terabyte per second speeds, the slower 5% that's gonna be moving all of that memory from like your RAM over to your graphics card with the initial memory bandwidth bottleneck is what's gonna be really, really dampening your performance. Because if you have 80 terabytes per second between those memory registers and it's for 95% of your work, but that 5%, is less than a terabyte per second, that is gonna be incredibly, incredibly slow. Having said all that, the two main things you're gonna to wanna to look for when understanding how a GPU is gonna perform in some application is gonna be high memory bandwidth because you want that 5% to be as quick as you possibly can. And the second is large and fast L1 cache and registers. And that was everything that I mentioned before. Bonus points if the cache and registers are easy to program with which is something that NVIDIA has done very, very well. And one of the reasons why they're leading now in deep learning and machine learning and all that jazz. Yes? What about for machine learning? Great question. So now that we have a working knowledge of how GPUs actually function, we're gonna look at the GPU specifications that you should be looking for for machine learning. First and foremost, you have to be looking for tensor cores. Tensor cores are relatively new to graphics cards, but they help improve performance in three main aspects. They reduce the use cycles for addition and multiplication operations by 16 times. They reduce the need for repetitive shared memory access, which increases the amount of cycles available for other shared memory access that is more important to the computation. These tensor cores are so fast that computation is no longer the bottleneck. Now it's just getting the data to these tensor cores to feed them, to get them to be able to produce whatever they have to produce. For those reasons, that's exactly why tensor cores is the number one thing that you need to look for now if you're shopping for a graphics card today. There's a lot more information on how tensor cores work, how they tie into matrix multiplication, convolutions, and how they speed everything up inside of the long blog post that I'm gonna leave inside the description. Next up, we have memory bandwidth. And if you think about tensor cores, it makes a lot of sense that that is the next thing that is important. Because tensor cores do the computation so quickly that just feeding them data is what is gonna be the biggest bottleneck in a graphics card. So you wanna look for a graphics card that has a large memory bandwidth. We went over the importance of memory bandwidth in the previous section, but this is incredibly important now, especially for the tensor cores. Finally, there's no surprises here. We have L1 cache and registers, taking a note from the previous section. However, we have shared memory now. Shared memory is basically the general memory on a graphics card that's gonna store the data about your machine learning model or the data that it has to churn through and process. You need to make sure that you have enough shared memory on your graphics card to be able to store whatever model you're wanting to train. A lot of natural language processing models, for an example, are well into like 50 gigabytes. So you need to make sure that you have enough VRAM on your graphics card to be able to handle those models plus whatever training data that you're feeding into it. 
Of course, L1 cache and registers, same thing as we mentioned before. One important thing to note is that the Tensor Core architecture does change on Volta and Ampere on NVIDIA graphics cards. Ampere uses three times less memory modules to feed the Tensor Cores than Volta. Not that this really makes a big difference in day-to-day -day activities because in reality, memory bandwidth is still gonna be your largest bottleneck, but it's something important to note. The performance difference between the Tensor Cores ends up being like one to 3%, which is not really that big of an impact if you're training just a normal data set. But I suppose if you're doing a really, really large data set that's gonna take a couple of months, one to 3% could be a couple of days less, which is a lot less power, which is fantastic. But I assume if you're training data sets that large, you probably have the money just to go buy yourself an A100 and call it a day. Yep, go ahead. What's the difference between inference and training? I'm glad you asked. Inference is when you just use the model as it was trained to do. And then training is when you're actually building the model and adjusting the weights of the neurons and the neural net. The two things you're gonna to wanna to look for when buying a graphics card for inference is memory for your model and power efficiency. You wanna make sure that you have enough memory on your graphics card to store your entire model on it so that you don't have to worry about reading off of like your RAM or your system disk or something that is significantly slower than exactly where the computation is gonna take place. The second thing you wanna look for is power efficiency. And that's because your inference card is not doing any crazy operations like multiplication or addition. It is just reading off of the, the neural net exactly how it was trained to do. You do not wanna be sucking back like 300 watts of power just to do that. NVIDIA makes super low power cards for this reason. And in a lot of cases, doing inference just off of a CPU is actually more power efficient than doing off of a graphics card. Of course, you run into the issue where CPUs do not have enough memory for your model. So they're gonna be slightly slower because you're reading out of RAM, which obviously has the longer distance between memory and the processing unit, which we spoke about before. But if you want just power efficiency, a CPU is a pretty good way to go forward with that. And that's it. That's the gist of how GPUs work, what you should be looking for if you're shopping for a machine learning GPU, and the difference between inference and training. Hopefully that was able to help you a little bit. Like I said, all the links are gonna be in the description. So if you wanna see like specific numbers or performance charts or even specific graphics card uh, suggestions around this current time, like 2022, you should definitely go check out all those links in the description. I hope this helped you as much as it helped me and I'll see you later. Ciao.